So what stood out to me in today's gospel was the peculiar difficulty of Jesus' advice. On the one hand, it should seem simple enough. Keep watch and do your job, right? Uh, be like a good servant who is found vigilant and watching when the master arrives. You don't have to do anything fancy. You don't have to do anything more than the work in front of you. But if you've ever stood for more than five minutes or had to sit still for even 10, such as when uh, you suffer through my homilies, uh, you know how difficult it can be, ironically, to do something as simple as sitting still. It can be difficult to remain faithful in even the simplest things and thus even more so in spiritual things. This reality speaks to a sin called sloth, and it's what I want to touch on today. Now, obviously, as English speakers, when we hear the word sloth, our mind first jumps to our slow-moving, eucalyptus leaf-eating mammal friend. Uh, these animals are so slow and lazy that it's actually impressive, and it's how they get their name. However, sloth is not a sin. Uh, I'm sorry, sloth as a sin is not necessarily just being slow or lazy, or for that matter, eating eucalyptus leaves, although those are poisonous, so don't do that either. Uh, rather, sloth at its core is actually an emotion. I know it sounds funny, but that's exactly what it is. Not just slowness or laziness, but actually an emotional movement. The definition of sloth is sorrow or sadness for spiritual good. Sorrow or sadness for spiritual good. Now, I need to clarify the sorrow or sadness for spiritual good doesn't mean that we're necessarily crying tears. But what it does mean is that whenever a spiritual obligation comes up, like going to Sunday Mass or saying some kind of daily prayers, commensurate with your state in life, uh, living out your marriage faithfully, or offering up your daily works with joy for, uh, with joy for God, things like that, you feel a deep aversion. You're malcontented, you have a deep dislike, and even an apathy for it. Or think about it this way. Little kids wear their hearts on their sleeves, and we've all seen a little kid's reaction when you tell them that they have to go somewhere that they don't like. Sweetie, it's time to go to the doctor to get your shots. No! I don't wanna! And then like a bunch of tears and it's really embarrassing, right? Typical tantrum. Well, as more mature teens and adults, we don't necessarily burst into tears when faced with things we hate, but we still experience the same sorrow, the same sadness that makes those kids cry, but just in a more subtle way. That is what is meant by the sorrow or sadness in this case. So when we're slothful, we experience this sadness at spiritual good. You may not have an exterior tantrum like little toddlers, but spiritual goods cause you to have an interior one. Ugh, daily mass, I'm sorry, no, not daily mass. Sunday mass, daily prayers, there we go. Do I have to do them? Do I have to go? Right, something like that. So, adults have tantrums too, they just look a little different, right? Now, all sloth, all movements of sloth are not only venial, but actually mortal sin. Actually mortal sin, not just venial. And you might be wondering, why is it such a big deal? We all struggle with our duties sometimes, so why would this be a sin, and even more so, a mortal one? Well, think about it this way. It is good to take pleasure in good things, but it is bad to take pleasure in bad things. So if you enjoy a game of golf or a slice of nicely baked cake or bringing a meal to a friend who just had her baby, handing a, water, a bottle of water to a man on the street, things like that, it's actually a good thing that you take pleasure in those things and those actions. And in the right context and amount, of course, I don't mean stuffing your face with the whole cake or playing 15 rounds of golf every week and ignoring your kids, right? What I mean is that it is good to take pleasure in good things and in good actions. But now imagine that I, Father Harold, am a kleptomaniac and I'm greeting you all outside after Mass and while you're chatting with me and I'm smiling, 
I'm actually trying to steal your wallets and your jewelry, and the porters of St. Joseph are dragging me off. It's a big old mess, right? So um, the point being here, I get a thrill out of stealing. That is to say, I take pleasure in stealing. Well, stealing is an evil thing, so this pleasure I feel when stealing is also an evil thing. That is to say, my heart is so deformed, so deformed that I'm actually taking pleasure in something that is bad, something that's evil. So not only is my action of stealing bad, the emotion of pleasure in that instance is also bad. So we're going to take the same concept and apply it right to sloth. So just as it is bad to take pleasure in bad things like that kleptomaniac, Father Harold, it is also bad to feel sorrow for truly good things. It is also bad to feel sorrow, aversion, dislike, disgust, apathy, that interior tantrum, that interior I don't wanna feeling toward good things. Well, consider this. God is our number one goal and the highest good. He's our eternal end, our gracious maker, our best friend, our creator, whom we should worship in thanksgiving for having created us. So our spiritual obligations and our relationship with God should bring us not only joy, but the most joy in our whole life. On the contrary, if our heart is so deformed that we not only take little joy in spiritual good, but literally instead feel aversion and apathy, sorrow, it means that our hearts are so deformed that we're feeling a sadness for the greatest good possible. Brothers and sisters, that is why sloth is so sinful. That's why it's such a big problem. It propagates the interior lie that our relationship with God, the highest spiritual good, is not only meaningless, but onerous. It is difficult. The spiritual, the interior lie that it's difficult. So sloth at its very core breaks our loving relationship with God and instead makes it a relationship of sorrow, makes it a difficult relationship. This brings us back to the gospel passage and Jesus' command to stay watching and waiting. If we are slothful, our most straightforward spiritual obligations, attending Sunday Mass, praying our daily prayers, living our vocation faithfully, are difficult and hateful for us. As a matter of fact, this hints at where the sloth, the actual animal, gets its name. If we hate doing something, we are slow to do it, or we ignore it altogether. We stand still and don't move, just like that sloth. So the fruit of sloth is neglecting spiritual good and other good works that we offer to God as well. In a very real way, then, Jesus is telling us in today's gospel to be on guard for sloth. We stand vigilant, doing our spiritual obligations, and resist those movements of sloth that keep us from serving God with joy, that keep us from a joyful, loving relationship with him. Now here's the deal, in this day and age, a lot of people struggle with sloth. There's a lot of hatred and aversion for religion today. But sloth has actually been a struggle of even the holiest of monks. Because of our fallen humanity, the things which delight us and the things in which we take sorrow are very easily out of order. So quite honestly, it's not a question of if you and I struggle with sloth. It's a question of how we deal with sloth. If you feel slothful aversion to your obligations to prayer, but push it away the moment you realize it, right? You don't act on it or let it sit there. Then it's not a sin or at worst, maybe a very light venial one. It is only when you realize that you're experiencing sloth and consent. Right, admit to that sorrow and let it just sit there. And even more, you let it keep you from your spiritual obligation, then, I'm sorry to say, you gotta get to confession, all right? Uh, and that's what it's here for. Don't be shy, right? It, the Lord knows it's difficult. That's why he gives us the grace of, the con of his mercy and confession. 
However, I want to leave you all, um, above all, with the cure for sloth. Are you ready? <laughs> it's resting in God's goodness, resting in his love. Resting in God's goodness and resting in his love. When we rest in the love of God and contemplate his goodness, it begins to reform our desires and change our hearts. This cure comes right from the teaching of St. Thomas Aquinas. Verbatim, he says, The more we think about spiritual goods, the more pleasing they become to us, and at once sloth dies away. So the truth of God's goodness and love soaks our minds and our hearts. And instead of feeling sorrow and dislike and aversion, and yes, that little interior tantrum, we begin to feel love, delight, and pleasure in God and in our spiritual obligations. If you already struggle a lot with sloth, then uh, this might be the very last thing you'd ever, ever feel like doing, right? Resting in that love. But no, brothers and sisters, that God beckons you. He beckons you. He wants your love and is so willing to lavish you with his graces and his deep love. At the very beginning of today's gospel, Jesus tells us, your father is pleased to give you the kingdom pleased to give you the kingdom. In the same way that the Father deeply delights in his Son at the River Jordan, so too does the Father deeply delight in giving us his Son and his love. It's literally the same word in the original Greek of the New Testament, that deep delight. So God deeply delights in you. He deeply delights in you, and he invites you to leave your sloth behind. Contemplate his love at this, at this Eucharistic celebration and let his grace wash over you at this Mass so that you can stand fast, be vigilant, and faithfully live your relationship in love with God.